absorb the, the uh, attention of all the Nazis and they will be able to make their escape pretending to be an entourage of the Fuhrers along with this one, uh, this one uh, Jew. Um, this, the reason why this movie is, again, arguably the first Holocaust movie is because the other movies that were made, 1942, there was a few other ones that were made around this time, 1941, they don't ever address Jews as being the actual um, main target of the persecution. It's, there's a, there's a concentration camp, but it's Czech prisoners, it's Polish prisoners, it's European prisoners. It's not Jews. It's just, it's a war film. There's plenty of war films. You have a war film. It's Germans versus Europe. It's Germans versus Poland, Germans versus whoever it is that they're invading next, but it's not Jews. This film actually points to the fact that there was Jews and Jews were, and, and the climax of the film actually revolves around this concept. So I'm just gonna try and, if you'll bear with me, the technical side of this is a little bit challenging, but I'm gonna try and um, uh, get uh, here, the, 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 the file that I'd like to get here. Um, and if you'll, if, you'll, if, you'll, if you'll bear with me, I'll try and play two clips from uh, to be or not to be. It's actually the wrong file here. Excuse me just a second. One second. One second, please. Bear with me, I appreciate it. Yeah, this is early on in the film. Uh, sometimes. This is early on in the film where uh, Joseph Tura is rehearsing, where the, where the theater company is rehearsing their, um, uh, their, uh, their play. He even says funny things about him, doesn't he? Well, he said they named a brandy after Napoleon, and they made a herring out of Bismarck, and Hitler's going to end up as a piece of cheese. Yes. Yeah. How did you know? Well, it's a, it's a natural thought. Oh, a natural thought. Well, I, I hope you don't misunderstand. I, I always well, that is, you see, we, we, we you see, Colonel. I hope you don't doubt my, Heil Hitler, Heil Hitler, Heil Hitler, Heil Hitler, Heil Hitler, Heil Hitler. Heil Hitler. Der Führer. Heil Hitler! Heil Hitler! Heil myself. That's not in the script. But, Mr. Dobosh, please. That's not in the script, Mr. Brunsky. Well, it'll get a laugh. But I don't want to laugh here. How many times have I told you not to add any lying? I want... You want my opinion, Mr. Dobosh? No, Mr. Greenberg, I do not want your opinion. All right, then let me give you my reaction. A laugh is nothing to be sneezed at. Mr. Greenberg, I hired you as an actor, not as a writer, understand? No. What does the script say? I make an entrance. And what do you say? Nothing. Then say nothing. Uh, but look, let's get going with the dollar rehearsal. I have to come in. Here am I sitting, waiting for my scene, all eager to go, and I have to wait and wait to be driven out of my mood just because two little actors in the cast want to enlarge their parts. Mr. Ravitch, what you are, I wouldn't eat. How dare you call me a ham? Folks, I want everybody to understand this. This is a serious play. Okay, sorry. I don't know. I'm I'm hoping that everybody was able to actually uh, hear that properly. Um, and now I'm just going to um, try and uh, go to the, later in the film when we see the. Um, are you all still with me? Are we still still good? Okay, good. Um, I will I will try and go to later in the film uh, where we uh, see um, uh, where we see where we see the 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 the, the, the recitation of the Shylock monologue by um, by um, uh, the character of oh whoops okay we got a problem um, uh, okay I apologize I I I um, I, uh, I seem to have uh, closed off there we go okay there we go okay no we don't want that okay. All right. Well, we'll have to we'll have to skip it. It's essentially, um, l l later in the film, later in the film, uh, the character of Greenberg um, here, um, represent, represented by a wonderful actor named Brassard, 
uh, sorry, in your lower in your lower um, in your lower right hand corner there delivers the Shylock monologue, um, and everything about that sequence that happens showing. Uh, I apologize that I lost the clip, but everything about that sequence showing the entrance of the Nazis into the building, into the theater, the bringing in of actual Hitler. You never see Hitler's face. Lubitsch didn't show Hitler's face. It shows the back of his head looking over the theater. Well, all of a sudden, 200 extras all, you know, raise their hands like that um, in, 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 the, in, the, in the classic salute. Um, it's haunting. It's absolutely haunting. So it brings about an interesting question. You know, can comedies be used for the purposes of of of, uh, of telling the story of, of going to the Holocaust, the answer is absolutely yes. Um, it's a question of how it's done. Um, obviously, the Holocaust, the Shoah, is no laughing matter. The, the The question to ask is, you know, how how why does why does a comedy work? Well, comedy can work because it softens us up. It lets us into characters that we care about, the same way a drama would. But then it brings about the darkness in a much more kind of um, rearing its ugly head way. Um, to Be or Not To Be is widely regarded as one of the best comedies ever made. Um, it is um, absolutely a, a, a phenomenal text. Um, and here are some, I've, I've just put together a list of takeaways, um, which is that number one, it's the awareness of the, it, 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 the biggest concept that we get out of this, which is something that resonates many times um, through many other films is the idea of performing to save one's life. This is an idea that comes up again and again and again and again throughout the years in Holocaust films. The idea that somebody would have to perform to put on a show to save their life is a remarkable idea. Um, if any of you have seen a movie, I don't mention The Pianist, um, uh, which came out 15 years ago. Uh, the Pianist there's a, you know, this is a great, uh, about a concert pianist. He has to run back into the Warsaw ghetto after it's been destroyed to find a place to hide. He finds a pile of rubble. There's a piano there and there's a Nazi there who finds him and says, are you that famous pianist? He says, yes, perform. And you know, right then and there, if he doesn't perform that etude well, he's going to die. Um, so this is an idea that finds its roots in to be or not to be. Um, the other thing to take away from there, the, many of the, the many things to take away, but one of the things I want to focus on is that is that is that there was this North American awareness of what was going on in Europe is 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 sort of spelled out. We know that basically, I, I don't think the, the concentration camps, yes, death camps, I don't think they were aware. Um, Lubitsch fought for this. He fought to make sure that the characters were identified. The character was identified as Jewish against the studio heads. The studio heads. They were trying to make money, you know. They were trying to run a business, um, and um, we can look at it however we want as an act of cowardice or as an act of uh, of, uh, of omission. But they didn't really want to identify Jews as being the 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 the, the preeminent. Um, they didn't want to advertise the the, the Jewish victimization in Europe, um, and Lubitsch found a way to get it in there. Um, and I'm, I'm convinced based on everything that I've read that he was very aware of what he was doing and he was very, very intent on what he was doing. Um, and um, it was, it, it's just a beautiful film. Um, so that's 1942. What's the next film we have up? Well, the next one we have up is something completely different. So Wanda Jakubowska was a Polish film director who, and I have conflicting reports on this, was the first woman ever nominated for an Academy Award uh, for directing. I believe it was for a short. She was an ardent socialist. She was with a group of, you know, other socialists, uh, you know, in the way you would have a uh, kind of a, 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 a clique in, in Europe that was found very commonly in that time. She was part of a group, a sort of a, a cabal of people that were getting together to discuss these issues and try and act, be activists on them. She was thrown into one of the concentration camps as a socialist. She was committed to making a movie about this. She heard about the story of Malka Zemetbaum. That's her on the left there. Malka Zemetbaum was kind of a famous hero that came out of that came out of the came out of the war came out of the Shoah. She was a character. She was Jewish. She obviously was a Jew. She was thrown in to Auschwitz. She did everything she could day and night to make the suffering 
to lessen the suffering of her, of, of her fellow prisoners, to do anything she could to make life easier on other Jews. She was constantly doing, she would give food. She would give this, she, would give, she was legendary for it. She started a relationship with a Polish guy named Gal Gal Galinsky, I believe his name was. And Galinsky and her vowed to escape. They did. They escaped. He posed as a Nazi officer. She posed as a, um, as his prisoner. They got out. They got to a town. They found a place to, to, to lay low. She went into a store a few days later to buy something. She got spotted by a random passerby. They both got caught. They got brought back to Auschwitz, and they were both hung on the same day at the same time in two separate quarters. Um, as she died, somebody slipped her a, a, a shiv, she, like a, a homemade knife. She cut her own wrists. She slapped the commandant who was going to hang her. And she proclaimed, you will die as a dog and I will die a hero. And then she died. Um, and then apparently the uh, Russian um, you know, allied forces came in a few days later or the same day or the next day or something. There's different records on it. Apparently when Galinsky was hung, his last words were long with Poland and he was hung. Well, Zemet bomb, uh, sorry, that was Malka's Zemet bomb. Um, Wanda Yakabowska wanted to put this to film. The amazing thing is she completely dropped, completely dropped the love story. She took that out completely. It's something that no producer or director would ever do today. You would never do that. But it was partially because she was committed to making a socialist propaganda piece. Really, this was intended as a socialist propaganda piece. But even though Film Polski, which was the, the, the board of, of Poland, funded the entire movie and they wanted the elimination of Jews. Again, you see this occurring again and again. Let's not make it about the Jews. It's a general persecution of Europe, uh, anything but Jews. Uh, 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 um, Jakubowska fought back. The main character was going to be Jewish. That was it. She was going to be identified as Jewish, and that was the way it was going to be. Yes, we'll show that all all the different people were being persecuted at the same time, but um, we're going to make sure that, it, that 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 she's a Jew. Here's what she did. This is kind of um, uh, it's it's it, 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 it's it's astonishing what she was able to accomplish. She went back to Auschwitz and shot the entire movie in Auschwitz Birkenau. All of the movie was shot in Auschwitz Birkenau. And most of the extras were actual concentration camp victims or tenants, one might say. Um, she somehow convinced, I don't know how many of them were Jewish. I don't think a lot of them were Jewish. I don't think the Jews wanted to go back. But the, but the neighboring Poles who were prepared to do it, also from the village over, came over and went back into Auschwitz Birkenau being paid to be extras in this movie and to be characters in this movie. Um, and apparently what happened on the set was that the actors playing the commandants, playing, playing the capos and playing the um, Germans were shocked. They were rattled to the core that when they would say, you know, whatever, stand here, bend over, the, you know, do whatever it was, you know, get on your feet, do this, do that, um, that they would do it like in a second. They, they, were, they, were, they were scared by the level of uh, abeyance that the actors immediately sort of fell into, even though it had been three or four years since they'd been there. Um, which I think speaks a lot to the kind of the, the, the shock of it. The plot of the film is pretty simple. Um, the plot of the film is that there's a Jewish woman in the, in the case of the movie named, Ma, named Marta Weiss. She's caught, she's brought to the camp. They discover very quickly that she can um, translate German and Polish and Yiddish and uh, I think Russian as well. They give her a job translating um, and she quickly tries to um, uh, find a way to, 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 to form a resistance. There's a doctor uh, who is, is attending to everybody. There's a woman doctor. Most of the cast is women. And the doctor's going to try and slip messages. She teaches her how to say certain phrases in Russian when the Russian en envoy is coming to view the camp. Because again, nobody knows what's going on. So the, 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 the doctor is going to say what's happening in Russian. She does. It's foiled by the Germans who say she's crazy and she's not actually a, a, a doctor in the first place. She's just nuts. They kill her. They replace her with a corrupt Jew uh, who basically starts uh, hoarding medicine and things like that for herself and to give to the capos. Um, and then at the end, uh, the character of Malka Weiss is hung, but not before she acts out greatly and slices the uh, slices the face of the commandant um, that she's uh, that she uh, that is trying to hang her. Um, what's amazing about the movie is that it really is. For those of you who, again, this is, I don't get too far into the, into the issues of style, 
but this really is the works of Eisenstein put to, and so, uh, Russian formalism put into the camps. It's, it's vivid, it, it visually vivid. It's tremendous. It's, it's staggering. Um, nothing to do with real, realism itself. It, basically, it's the clash of this image against this image forms what the emotional response is in the mind of the audience. That's the idea of Russian formalism, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. This is no better felt than in the scene, it's actually quite early on in the film, where a baby is born to one of the prisoners and they do their best to hide it. They can't hide it. The Nazi officer comes in, takes the baby, pulls it away from the mother, takes it into the next, the next room, the, uh, the, the sort of medical office. The baby starts to cry and the baby's crying. He puts the baby down on the table. There's a close-up of the baby. The baby's crying. He sits down at his desk. He pulls out notes. He pulls out a pen. He makes some, the camera pulls in on his notes. He goes, makes some notes. The baby's crying the whole time throughout. Goes to a medicine cabinet, pulls out a syringe, puts some, puts it in a vial, pulls it, puts the vial down, squirts it to make sure it's full, starts whistling, baby's crying, walks out of frame, Baby's crying, push, the camera pushes in on the medicine cabinet. We see that it's poison. Baby stops crying. He keeps whistling. The only reason I walk you through that is because it's, a, it's an exemplification of the use of this fantastic filmmaking, Russian, film, R Russian formalism, to achieve a, 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 an incredibly dramatic effect. The movie was brave. It was tremendous. Um, and it was far and away the most influential Holocaust movie ever made for anybody else who made a film after. Spielberg revered this movie. He revered uh, The Last Stage. Um, a lot of this, the, 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 the sequences in Schindler's List are pulled from The Last Stage in, in one way or another. And it's, it's just a huge achievement. It is very difficult to find a good quality transfer. It hasn't been restored. There are DVDs floating out there, um, but it's a very tough film to find. And it is a tremendous, tremendous film. Um, Again, Film Polsky wanted to bury the Jewish part of it. They put a list of people who were persecuted in the credits. Jews appear at the bottom of the list. Um, in, in Auschwitz, you know, 1.1 million people were, were murdered. 975,000 were Jews. That's the way it goes. Um, but it was a tremendous film that impacted greatly. Um, the next movie is, the next film is truly a, a landmark. It's a landmark across all of cinema. It's called Night and Fog. Night and Fog was essentially originally conceived as a kind of museum piece. There was a, ten, there was a, there was a uh, display, a uh, exhibit at, um, I, believe, I believe it was inside one of the French camps. And the French government decided they wanted to put together a 10 year uh, memorial film effectively, memorializing the resistance, because of course the French were so into the resistance. Um, and so they put together a, uh, a team to try and create this, um, create this film. They hired Ella Rainey. Rainey then became one of the most successful surrealist filmmakers of all time. And Rainey sat down and made something a little bit different because when he started getting footage from the Germans that he had to you know, basically force out of them, of the camps, and what was done in the camps, footage that the Germans took very proudly. He decided he, had, he couldn't make it about the resistance. He had to make it about the concentration camps and he had to make it about what is going on here. Around this time, the, the mid to late fifties is when Europe starts to have a, a crisis of conscience. It's visible in almost all the art movements of the time. Um, there's no uh, coincidence that Waiting for Godot was written in the late fifties. And if you look at that play, about two men standing in the middle of a barren wasteland with only one tree, wondering why they go through the same thing every day. It's reflective of, of, of this, this kind of crisis, existential crisis from the war, from the Shoah. Rene he only uses four elements in this film. One, footage of him, that he shot in color going to the camps um, 10 years later and just showing elements of what's there, the buildings, the barbed wire, weeds growing over 
Um, also getting in closer, things like here's a vent where Cyclon B would have been dropped down. Here's an oven, here's this, here's that. Those elements, very slow moving, very simple picturesque details of the camps. Two, footage from the Germans or from the Allied forces when they broke in and, and, um, and um, liberated everyone. Three, a voiceover that was had a poem written by a, uh, a, a famous uh, uh, author named Carol um, that sort of accompanies the entire thing, explaining what you're seeing. This is just a field. This is just a, this is, but the road leads to a concentration camp where a few years ago, bad things, you know, terrible things happen. And it, like this, it starts to go, in, go into detail about, about the camps, about what happened to the camps. And it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. It talks about medical experiments. It talks about amputations. It talks about every matter, matter of horror. It talks about the capos quite a bit. It talks about the, 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 the what, what was going on with the Germans and what was going on with the Jews at the same time. The word Jew is never said in the movie. All of the, all of the um, victims are represented as either deportees or prisoners. Now, there is a debate as to why this is the case. Um, there's a debate as to why Rainey chose to do this. A lot of uh, um, uh, document, documentary historians will say that he did this because he was uh, trying to show that this was a universal thing. I'm not so convinced. I, I, I do believe that there was a certain element of hiding or smearing out um, what was, you know, the, the, to not focus on Jews because we don't really want to focus on Jews. But it, again, it's a debated point. The bottom line is that the movie is 32 minutes long. And as one very dear friend of mine once said, he said after he saw that he never wants to see the movie again and never wants to see any other Holocaust movie again. He said that's what, that's what did it for him. Um, there is, the, if you see that one uh, photograph, which should be appearing now, uh, the, the French censors uh, uh, fought against this one, which showed a clearly French hat on that on that police officer they wanted that removed they didn't want any admittance to you know french complicity in the war or in the or, or in the holocaust um the movie is astonishing um uh, uh, like 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 almost all the movies on the, that, that we're discussing today it's it's profound it's very difficult to watch and it kind of paved the way for almost all in many ways it shifted all of do, what do, what people perceive documentary to be um, the music is haunting. It makes it, it's very odd contemporary music. It does not fit well. It's not. It's it's kind of bizarre. The whole thing is presented in a very, very bizarre light, and it asks the question: Who's responsible for this? Were the Germans responsible? Were the Capos responsible? Were the bystander responsible? Um, so basically, it's 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 a it's a meditation on on on, on an existential crisis. It's a very interesting film. Um, and I believe there's a direct connection between this film and the fact that Hannah Arendt's uh, uh, concept of the banality of evil uh, came out right around the same time. I believe this is a perfect exemplification of the idea of the banality of evil. Okay, we're gonna start moving a little bit quicker. Um, okay, what we have here, I, I, I bring these two up because um, between my next film that I'm talking about is actually 1964. Between 1955 and 1964, more films were made, but I don't think these are the pictures that actually, I'm not criticizing the movies. The Diary of Anne Frank by George Stevens is a fine film and Judgment Nuremberg is a very fine film, but they are um, less challenging to the audience. They were very much in the sense of a period piece. The thing about a period piece is when we walk in to the theater to watch a period piece, what goes through our minds is, oh, I'm safe because that happened over there. It doesn't confront us. It doesn't challenge us. It doesn't make us feel threatened by it. This is very much the case with the Diary of Anne Frank and Judgment at Nuremberg. Um, they're both uh, kind of safe places to sit. The Diary of Anne Frank, I mean, is is uh, the um, it's the uh, uh, the fiddler on the roof of the Holocaust. And, uh, you know, it, it just it's perennial. Every year, every couple of years, is another version of it. That's not to demean the book, not to demean Anne Frank. Not, I mean, she's obviously the Nazi tried to kill her. She's still living on. Thank God, um, but um, uh, but um, it's it's that it, it seems to be the safe place for people to go when they want to tell a story of the Holocaust. This is not to demean the film; the film is a good film. But as far as actually pushing our sensibilities, pushing the audience's concept of what really happened or or how to how to grapple with what happened, I don't think these films are sort of at the forefront of that. They're kind of the film equivalent of easy listening. 
the next film that really pushes things is The Pawnbroker. Now, The Pawnbroker, which many of you, and I'm getting to the films where I can see that probably many of you are maybe more familiar with these films. The Pawnbroker is the first example of a realism in cinema approach to the Shoah. The film did not take place in the Holocaust. The film takes place, uh, Rod Steiger plays a pawnbroker who is a survivor. It's 20 years later. He's sitting in Manhattan. He's numb to everything. He's numb to the violence around him in these awful New York neighborhoods. He's numb to people looking for connection. He doesn't want a connection. At least he thinks he doesn't. Um, he's numb to all of these things. He just wants to stay, ironically, behind bars in his pawn shop. He wants to stay with, with the window and, and the bars in, in front of him. He ends up connecting with a local, a local boy from the neighborhood and he refuses to, he, he keeps him at arm's length. He won't let him fully in. Um, and at the end of the film, he kind of holds the boy in his arms while he's dying. And there's a, there's a, a, a um, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a mistaken attempt at trying to rob his store um, because he, the boy feels affronted. So he hires some other thugs to go in and rob his store. It doesn't work out. The boy ends up getting killed. As Rod Steiger's holding the boy at the end, he finally, all the emotion comes out. He's finally able to let go. During the film, it's punctuated by uh, flashbacks. This is Lummet's style. This is Lummet's hard cutting style. He had a very specific way that he used in many of his other films, Dog Day Afternoon, um, uh, several others which are escaping me right now, but he's a brilliant filmmaker, um, uh, uh, Serpico. Um, Lummet, uh, took on this film and it's a it's shot in black and white but it is a gritty street realism film it's the first example really of realism in cinema again realism is a loaded term so don't jump down my throat when i say realism realism is a style of film which um basically brings sympathy to every major character and is usually about smaller things not bigger things this works in this context because it shows us it was the first example of survivor guilt um it was the first example of on film of maybe not the first but it was one, it was one of the more major examples of uh, survivor guilt it was um a great representation of putting the horrors of the holocaust into a sort of context of somebody in current day at that time the film still holds up beautifully um rod steiger's performance is unbelievable um the, the cutaways themselves to the, the shots of the Holocaust, he's in, he's, you know, he's, he's, he's staring at something and all of a sudden he gets a flashback to being in that train and having to hold his own kid over his shoulder and he can't hold him over his shoulder anymore and he drops his kid and his kid can get trampled by other people stuffed in that train. None of them actually look very realistic. They look very cartoony. The, 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 the costumes don't look real. This doesn't look real. But they still have a profound effect because of the fact that we're seeing it through the main characters, the, the Nazer, uh, uh, Nazerman's um, mind. It, it just works. It's a, it's a confrontation. Um, it's a tremendous film. Um, it brings with areas behind the bars. It brings about the question of survivor guilt. Um, and it also was, there's monologues in the film where Steiger lectures the kid on what it means to be a Jew. And this is really kind of the I don't say the first, but it's one of the very early representations of Jews being very Jewish on film and being very Jewish about the whole situation. We keep moving forward. Okay, so the day the clown cried. So there's only been, I, I was talking about this a few nights ago with a few, with a few friends. Um, I'm just gonna get a little more personal for a second. Um, there's only been three movies that have ever, ever made me uh, uh, cry. Um, one of them happened to be a Holocaust film that we'll talk about uh, in a few. Um, and I can explain why. Uh, this is the first movie that I never saw that put me to tears. Um, just reading up about it, uh, it, I think it's not just the concept of the story, although that is incredibly uh, devastating. It's also, um, it's also the... Um, the, the, the way by which the movie came about. Jerry Lewis, I'm assuming most of you know who he is. For those of you who don't know, he was a son of a vaudeville performer who wasn't very good. He became a tremendously successful vaudeville performer. He went into the comedy clubs in New York where he met uh, Dean Martin. Him and Dean Martin went on stage. 
uh, they were immediate hit. Well, second night, they were the first night they bombed. And between the, and then they went to Hollywood. Between the years of 1947 and 1957, they made 17 films that grossed a combined total of $2 billion around the world when the price of a movie ticket was between a nickel and 15 cents. Adjusted for inflation, forget about it. While Jerry Lewis is doing this, he became one of the most technically adept filmmakers. He started directing their films. He had directed many more after they split. He was incredibly knowledgeable about film. Most people don't know this, about filmmaking. He was as technically sound as anybody. Um, he taught courses at USC or UCLA. I can't remember which. He invented things to help him on set. He invented the idea of a video assistant, put a video camera next to the film camera so I can see the take immediately instead of having to wait a day for the dailies. He invented a thing called the noisy toy, which was a, a cart that he slept around with him to make sound effects on set to see if the acting would work with the sound effect rather than adding it later. He was known for his physical comedy. Well, along comes a producer by I believe the name of Washburger, who has this script to The Day the Clown Cried. It asks Lewis to make it. Lewis didn't want to make it. He talked him into it. Lewis talked himself into it. And they decided to go shoot this movie. Um, so the movie is about a clown. The movie is about a circus clown who's past his prime. He used to be famous. He used to travel the world. He used to go all over the place. And now he's a bit of a wash up and he's not doing very well in the circus. And the circus wants to let him go. And his wife is very mad at him because he won't stand up for himself. He doesn't stand up for himself. He gets fired. He goes to a bar. He gets drunk and he starts ranting about how much he hates Hitler and he hates, hates, hates the National Socialists, hates fascism, the Nazis. And he uh, is caught doing this. He's outed for, for publicly dissenting and he is um, put into a concentration camp. So he's in the concentration camp and he still talks about the days of his being this clown, being loved, being adored. The other inmates don't really like him that much. They don't really tell him that he's not very good anymore or, you know, it's kind of no good anymore. And then all of a sudden, um, next door in, you know, through the fence, a group of, of children is brought in, Jewish children are brought in and um, he can't help himself. So he goes over there and tries to make them laugh and he can't stop. And he's warned not to make them laugh. You can't do that. They're not here to do that, but he can't help himself other than to go over and try and make the kids smile every day. Um, and they warn him, you know, we're going, you know, no matter what they warn him, he won't stop. So when they haul the kids away to go to the next camp, he goes with them. And then, <laughs> apologize. He goes into the gas chambers with them because he doesn't want to leave them alone. <laughs> anyway, um, I think the concept that someone would go that far to try and ease the suffering of others is just staggering. Um, what happened was that as they were making the film, Washburger never came up with the money. So Jerry Lewis funded the movie himself. He ended up putting in $2 million of his own money to make the film. He put in $2 million of his own money to make the film, and then it became clear they didn't have the rights. So then it became a rights battle because Washburger didn't have the rights. The rights battle ensued. And even though it was sorted out, Lewis hated the film. He never thought he could get it right. He never thought he got a good edit of it. The film was never released. He gave it to the Library of Congress. It's due to be shown for the first time in two years, in 2024, two, three years. So I will be there when it screens. If any of you would like to come with me, you're welcome to come with me and I would love to join you. Um, but it, it has been seen by a handful of people. I think Harry Shearer, or Christopher Guest, one of the two, uh, both geniuses, watched it and said it's absolutely in its own way a perfection. Um, um, there's nothing about the movie that they said could be in its own imperfect way, more perfect. Um, and again, we see this concept of performing to save somebody's life or performing to try and just enhance the experience of others. Um, and this is, this movie is owed a lot when it comes to life is beautiful, right? 
that that that, that movie owes a lot to it. And there's a, there's another film that came out a few years later called Jacob the Liar, not the American one. That was a remake of the German one, Jacob the Liar, and that was owed a lot to to this movie as well. Okay, again, two movies I want to touch on. Um, Sophie's Choice was absolutely staggering film. Nothing, there's nothing bad to say about the movie. It won multiple Academy Awards. It, it was amazing. Does it add to the language of Holocaust films? Not really. Um, it's kind of an extension of other things. Julia, on the other hand, is the weirdest uh, arrangement of agreements. I don't really want to talk about it because it's not because it's not really one of the movies I'm focused on, but it is fraught with interesting uh, elements to it, beginning with the fact that Lillian Hellman wrote it as what she claimed was an autobiography or autobiographical moment. Since that time, it's been revealed that she didn't really have this experience um, or that people believe, don't believe that she had this experience, that, that she started making, basically fabricating things, that it's a story of a woman going into, um, uh, having to go into, uh, uh, Jane Fonda plays Lillian Hellman, the, the person who goes to meet up with her old friend, Julia, who's now working for the resistance in Germany and has to bring her $50,000 under the threat of, of, of being killed. And does she do it or doesn't she do it? You know, you know, will she do it? And then the second half of the movie is all about this, this kind of tense uh, cat and mouse game. Um, uh, it's kind of ironic to compare this movie to, you know, other really hard hitting, you know, uh, 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 Holocaust films. I mean, in, in Schindler's List, there's a boy who has to hide in a latrine surrounded in human feces to try and survive another 10 minutes while guards are looking with guns. Here, uh, Jane Fonda has to comb her hair. I'm not exaggerating. She actually has to comb her hair in one season. Comb your hair. Comb your hair, Lillian. Comb it. It's like, that's like, that's the threat. So, um, uh, it's beautiful film. It's incredibly well made. But the irony is that after this movie was made, um, uh, Redgrave, Vanessa Redgrave, won the best Academy Award for supporting teacher for basically doing nothing on screen. I'm really not trying to discredit her as an actress. She's an amazing actor. But in this case, not much going on in this performance. Fine. She, she gets the Academy Award, gets up on stage, talks about how she was committed to fighting anti-Semitism with the filmmakers, then buries in a comment about um, Zionist hoodlums and how we can't let that happen either. Oh, and by the way, I also want to fight anti-Semitism and gets off the stage. So the movie itself is fraught with this kind of weird series of circumstances. Um, interesting example of, of, of something to, to look at beyond just itself. But as a period piece, it's just a very luxurious, lush period piece. It kind of makes Francis Ford Coppola's The Good Gatsby look like it was shot in somebody's backyard with a hand movie camera. It's huge budget, incredible sets and costumes, but not much to write home about. Showa. Okay, so the next landmark film to occur in our journey here is Showa. So what happens is Claude Landsman is a French filmmaker, and um, the Israeli government approaches him and says, can you make a film about survivors that'll be like, you know, like a two-hour film and can you deliver it to an 18 months? He says yes. He then goes about and starts to shoot, and after two or three years, the, the, the Israeli government gives up on him. They say, like, look, we can't wait around. It's kind of like the PhD candidate that can't finish his thesis, just can't, you know, can't get it done. So Landsman um, just can't, just uh, can't stop. He ends up shooting for the next nine years or 10 years. He then edits for the next five years after that, okay? Ran out of money, found more money, ran out of money, found more money. He shot 350 hours of film. And this is shooting on 16 millimeter where each can of film costs money. It's not, you know, like my phone, which you could do today. Um, what emerged out the other end is widely regarded as a, a massive landmark in documentary filmmaking. Um, he doesn't have any stock footage. It's just survivors, just either in their homes or going back to the concentration camps where, or the places where they were, where these things happened in Europe. Some of the people interviewed are Germans. Some of them are, 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 are war criminals. So, some of them he had to put in hidden cameras. He got beat up at one point for getting caught doing this. Other people had violent threats put against them for doing this sort of thing. He did everything he could to sort of creep in there from 1973 through till 1980 or 82 to get all this done and to shoot all this. The movie is nine and a half hours long. Okay. It's absolutely um, absorbing for every single second of it. 
if you look at the list, the Sight and Sound is a British organization that uh, accumulates the, the thoughts of directors and, and critics all over the world. Every 10 years, they do a ranking of the best 10 movies ever made and the best 10 directors ever. And they have all kinds of ways of categorizing the list. Com making art into a competitive thing is kind of silly. Is the Mona Lisa better than the Sistine Chapel? I mean, who, who, it's, it's but nonetheless, we do it. And um, on that list of documentaries, there's, they have a specific documentary list. Shoa is considered number two of all time. And Night and Fog is considered number four. One is 32 minutes long and completely, um, not surrealist, but just, just completely um, alienating and distancing and challenging in the way it's presented with very bizarre elements. And Shoah is the exact opposite in, in a documentary framework. It is just completely smooth and, uh, and, 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 um, it doesn't, it doesn't aim to, to punch us in the face. It just aims to let us watch. We still watch with horror when we see, I think Roger Ebert said about this film, he said, it's not a retelling. It's not, it's just an act of witness. Um, it's a tremendous, uh, it's a tremendous film. Um, the uh, Criterion did a phenomenal transfer of it uh, to Blu-ray a few years ago uh, or 10 years ago. It is, it, it's an immaculate transfer. It should be uh, seen. It, sh it should absolutely be seen. Um, also, a brief note about Night and Fog. In 1990, there was a terrorist attack against a, against a, um, a synagogue in France, I believe. I could, uh, please, uh, if I'm wrong about this, I apologize, but I believe this is what happened. And so the, <coughs> the French government uh, instituted that uh, Night and Fog was aired on all three major networks at the same time on one night. They forced it onto the air that, that it should be watched again. But anyway, the irony is that one is 32 minutes long, the other was nine and a half hours long, and they're both in their own way kind of equally compelling about, about the Holocaust. Okay, the movie that I'm assuming very few of you have seen, <laughs> sorry, I jest, um, Schindler's List. So Schindler's List absolutely has a place on this, on this, on this discussion uh, for nothing else for the fact that it um, it was the most successful Holocaust movie ever made. It was the most, it was the one that brought it to the world. Um, interestingly, the Jews, other than Ben Kingsley's character, the accountant, uh, Isaac Berg, or Eisenberg or whatever his name is, um, the Jews are kind of wallpaper in the movie. It doesn't, I mean, there's, 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 there's sequences where they say they list their names over and over again. They list their names, you know, uh, Friedman, Goldberg, this, that, the other. So it, the Jews are given this presence but there was this element that everyone seemed to leave the theater loving this element of the, of the, of the red coat um, that you, that we find, you know, the little girl wearing. Um, I, I think that was kind of a, an indicator that there was a need to try and attract our attention to one person to try and give us something, to give us something to hold on to because the main character of the film is Schindler, Oscar Schindler. What's beautiful about the movie is to see it's, it, it is, it is a different genre of film than I don't think was previously seen in Holocaust films to date, which is the I, the concept of the out of the bottle, where a wi there's a wish fulfillment at the beginning of to, to our main character has a wish fulfillment, and then you realize the the character realizes over the course of the arc of the story that that's not exactly what they really wanted. So, in other words, Oscar Schindler at the beginning of the movie just wants to be just wants to you know have wealth, and he gets it very quickly. He's able to sweet talk not, uh, the Nazi uh, officers. He's able to open up his munitions farm. He's able, uh, 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 he's able to get the, the factory going, get Jews working for him. Boom, he makes it great, has money. He says, he even says like he, he's packing up trunks, load of money. I have more money than ever, any man could ever spend the rest of his life. And then we slowly see over the course of time that he realizes that this, he comes to this realization that, that what's going on here is awful. And he spends every last penny he has after he makes it just trying to save more Jews. There's that wonderful shot in the middle where he's holding up that button. I've only seen the movie once. I was 16 years old. I saw it in the theater. I remember it like it was yesterday. So that absolutely says a lot for Schindler's List. Um, you know, he's there holding that button saying, this could have saved one. You know, the car could have saved six. This could have saved one, right? Um, so it, the, the movie brought a new genre to the Holocaust films. It, used a non-Jew as a main character in a way that I think was extraordinarily effective. Um, most of the cinematography, most of the way by which the movie is presented is a direct lift from the last stage 
Okay, it absolutely it uses. There's nothing. There's no realism in this movie visually whatsoever, or in terms of its presentation. It is a highly stylized movie. Okay, realism and and the Holocaust don't really get along that well. I mean, maybe say, again, I, I sort of mentioned this earlier on. What is realism? Realism in the concept of just checking the time. Okay, we're gonna we'll, we'll move on. But realism is the concept of, of, of sympathy for every single character. Um, a good example of modern day realism would actually be the, the series, which many of you have seen, maybe on your neighbor's internet because you don't have it, which is uh, Shoah. Uh, Shoah is a very good example. Sorry, it's not Shoah, uh, Shtissel. Shtissel is a very good example of realism where you have sympathy for every character and the stakes are often um, lower down. Or it's a sort of smaller things. That's why the pawnbroker was kind of a, a, a forerunner in this, in this regard. Um, Schindler's List owes a lot to the last stage. Um, uh, Spielberg never hid that; he never denied it. Um, and um, and it's it, but but it is it is a tremendous movie. It has an impact, and it has a huge sort of global impact to the awareness of the Holocaust. It also happens to be, um, I think, one of the few examples of showing religiousness in the context of Holocaust films. We'll get to this a little bit later, but Jews are shown. It took enough time for that to happen, but Jews are shown. We, we, we've identified Jews in the Holocaust. We've identified Jews in movies in the Holocaust. But the actual religious element is very seldom dealt with. The idea of a crisis of faith, the idea of, of challenges of maintaining faith or dropping faith or whatever the case is, or never mind the, uh, um, the, 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 the machinations of a religious, of, the, of, 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 of as uh, Rabbi Soloveitch would say, the homo religio in the context of these places, the Warsaw ghetto, the concentration camp, living in the forest, whatever, it's, it's not really found. There are stories people have told me, like my father ran out to, to go and find flowers so he could bake his own matzah on a rock and he baked the matzah on a rock, or whatever the case is, right? Um, you don't see that, you know, or, or they made a sukkah by putting, you know, putting sticks down over a pit in the ground. They dug the pit down to the, you don't see it really represented. It's really not there. Schindler's List opens and closes on the candles being lit, um, which is the cut from the candle, the plume of smoke off the candles to the train. It's kind of a, a takeoff of a David Lean edit from, from uh, Bridge Over the River Kwai. But you don't, this is really, it's a, it's a rare, it's a rare thing. It, it, it it, it's there in some other films, not really that much. Okay, Life is Beautiful. I mentioned that there were three movies that made me uh, made me made me cry, and one was the Holocaust, and one was this one. Uh, this movie split critics. Um, some people felt it was again. We see this issue of a comedy representing the Holocaust to great effect. Some people just don't like it. They don't like to see it. They don't think it's appropriate. They don't think it's it's an effective tool, or they think it, it's it's a it's a, it's a, it's a cheap shot. Um, so many critics really didn't like this movie a long time after the fact. They hated it. Uh, the reason why it got me was because I had no idea what it was about. I had no clue what this movie was about. I went into the theater with my parents. Father and my mother were sitting there. And movie starts. Beautiful Italian, French comedy. He's this hilarious character. He's going after this woman. She doesn't give him the attention. She won't give him the attention. He fights and he fights. He finally wins her over. There's this wonderful sequence where it pushes into the garden, the greenhouse, and pushes back out. A boy runs up. They've had a boy. I'm already on. I'm like, wow, I'm, I'm down for the ride on this. And then all of a sudden, people show up at the door, and they want to take them away. I'm thinking, why are they taking Where's the story going? Why do they want to take them away? And he's trying to cheer his kid up as they get onto a train. Why are they getting onto a train? Why did everything just change? They get off the train. They go into this camp. Why are they getting into the camp? This is what's going through my mind as I'm watching this. All of a sudden, they walk into the barracks. A hundred gaunt, emaciated Jewish faces turn with their ragged robes to look at it. The boy starts to cry, and I was gone. I was completely gone. Um, I was in, in. I was uh, in shock. Isn't the wrong word. I was just. I felt cheated. I felt um, tricked. Um, it was just. I just never seen, I just never seen anything. I, I just wasn't prepared for it. So um, uh, the same concept this, uh, th that applied to the day the clown cried applies here, except to Benini's credit, he took it in a very different direction. Um, it still ends on a down note with, 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 with the main character dying, but his son lives and his wife lives. 
and they're reunited at the end. Um, I believe, does it tread new ground? I mean, I, I, I think so. I think it takes where the clown, the day the clown cried and it goes a step further with it for us trying to give it a bit of, a, of, of an up ending instead of a down ending. Um, but also it was the use of the visuals that was much more about Italian and French sort of studio style filmmaking that had never been done before. And it had a tremendous impact. Um, and also, again, it was, it was, it was a, a, a reintegration of comedy. Um, I think the film is beautifully done. Uh, it's, it, it was an incredible example of, of uh, a real effort in filmmaking. And, 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 and there's a lot we can sort of um, uh, take away from it um, as, as a text. Um, I think it's, I think it's a tremendous film. Now, we'll arrive at a movie, which I don't know why it never got the attention that it, I, I believe it should have had, um, which is um, The Gray Zone. Tim Blake Nelson, is a genius. He's young. He's uh, he was a young man at the time. He, I think, uh, had has, has studied under one of the foremost doctors of philosophy in uh, in the Ivy League uh, in, the, in the in in the world of the Ivy League. He uh, was a brilliant student. He was also an actor, incredible actor. He, went, I think, he did his. I, I can't. I don't quite have his full career in in my head, but he was he was known as being a triple threat. He could act incredibly well sing and dance and he i had no idea until recently he was jewish he's fully he's, he's as jewish as Moshe Rabbeinu. his parents his grandparents were survivors um he has a 100 jewish background um he was born and raised in oklahoma tim blake nelson uh, was also a, a very a very prolific writer um and um and and sort of cinem cinematic thinker he took a chapter from the primo levy book uh, the, the late, one of the later Primo Levi uh, books was a series of chapters that are all kind of unrelated. One chapter is called The Gray Zone. The Gray Zone references an actual doctor who survived the camps, a Jewish doctor who was put into, um, I believe Hungarian, who was put into one of the camps, survived and managed to bribe his wife and daughter out as well. And there was actually a time when that doctor attended to a kid who somehow survived the gas chambers. It actually happened. The kid was later killed. The Gray Zone is, in my opinion, the best Holocaust movie ever made. Okay, now I know saying, you know, the best Holocaust movie ever made, my favorite Holocaust movie is kind of saying, uh, you know, my favorite funeral. Like, uh, oh, did you go to Schmoltz funerals? Oh, man, those, those has paid them. We're grabbing, I mean, we're talking about awfulness. But I believe that this is the most effective, um, I don't know if it's the most effective because Shoah is up there, obviously. All these films are, are in some way or another. The Gray Zone to me is an incredible effort because it does not attempt to show just one story or follow one through line with one character. It is very much what we would call an institutionalized film. It is about the institution. Everybody is corrupt in this. It follows the stories of the capos, um, the solar commandos who are planning to bomb crematorium one and three inside um, Auschwitz. They're not planning on surviving. They're not planning on getting out. They just want to bomb it and go down and, and go down on their sword because they know they're not going to make it much longer. But in the time while they're planning and they're trying to arrange this, we see we, the, the action of the movie basically drifts around the camp very effortlessly, showing things in staggering simplicity over here a capo leaves the leaves leaves his barracks while 20 or 30 other prisoners are marched the opposite direction they're lined up against the back of a wall and one by one somebody comes along and pop 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 bodies are thrown into ovens like this the stories are told the, st the stories amongst them are told steve buscemi's character at one point is committed he's like no i'm gonna survive i'm gonna get out of here i don't care and, and they say well what, what, you know like do you really want to live with what you've done. And he says, I hope I live till I'm 90. That's the line. He says, I hope I live till I'm 90. The next scene, a Nazi officer walks in and says, what are you doing here? He says, oh, I was, I was sent. I, you can't come up with a line. Bang, he's dead. Spoiler alert. Okay. Everybody in the movie dies. Everybody dies. The girl that they save from the bottom of the, sh uh, from, from, from the shower managed to survive the gas chamber. She dies. Everybody, everybody gets killed. Nobody gets out. 
I believe that the movie is a landmark because it employs elements of realism. Um, everybody in the in the movie is both is fallible, from from, from it, it, which is not about it's not about making people bad people. It's just that the, it shows the gritty nature of the potential negotiation between a Jew and a German. You know, how could that? How could one gain leverage on the other? How could it be actually a a two sided thing as far as trying to survive one more day? And the movie asks the question very directly. One character says it. Nobody knows. What you would be prepared to do to live one more day until you're asked. And that's the note that the film leaves up on. Um, I think it's, 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 it's a great film. A lot of people commented on Son of Saul, which was from 2015. Son of Saul owes a lot to this movie. Son of Saul took the same story about somebody surviving the chambers and puts it in. It just gives it a, a, a single character arc. And it ends very much on, on the same. Now, I'm not saying Son of Saul. Son of Saul is a bad movie. Son of Saul is a fantastic Hungarian film from 2015. It's a fantastic film. Got nominated for all things. But The Gray Zone, in my opinion, is intention. Everything about it works. The performances are kind of intentionally stilted um, or, or sort of um, put off a bit, like sort of set back a bit. And I, I, I just recommend it to anybody to watch. I think it's, 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 it's a shocking and engaging and incredibly... Um, um, challenging film to watch. So again, just to <coughs> go back, I just want to group everything together, and then I'll and then I'll and I'll, I'll, I'll bring up one final point, which is about how we can connect this to 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 the concept of uh, of uh, Tisha B'Av, all of what we've been talking about. We have films that are documentaries. We have films that are comedies. We have films that are are basically one person journey. We have films that are, that sort of ask the question about the group, the individual versus the group. Um, there's almost every genre of film about different types of, this is, these are terms that are phrased by a guy who wrote a book on screenwriting about the different types of categories of films. I'll skip that. Um, again, there's very little appearance of religion in the films. I asked, I, I've asked this question to a few people now and I haven't gotten a good clear answer why. Um, I think it's just because um, the nature of the anti-Semitism of the Nazis was to persecute our lives and so therefore, um, when, you know, it, it, the, the, the primal stakes of survival sort of trumps that of a religious conundrum. Um, but there is no reason why these types of questions or, or, or thoughts can't be, or ideas can't be brought into, uh, brought into the, the, the world of Holocaust films. Um, this is where I just want to lead to. In 2005 to 2008, three movies were released, and these were almost released all at the same time. I know that one was a few years earlier, but really it sort of came out in the States at the same time. Three movies all exploring the Holocaust from the German side, from the German viewpoint. Valkyrie, an American action movie starring Tom Cruise as a Nazi, and Tom Cruise is the good Nazi who's going to take down Hitler. The Reader was the somber British film about um, you know, a, a, a woman who was a Nazi, but she was not really, you know, she, she, she is guilty, but how was, she, you know, and, and sort of the, 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 the friend that she makes who wants to go and doesn't realize the gravity of the situation is very sort of British, sort of sappy, long drama. And then finally, the German movie, which was just watching Hitler crumble in his own uh, barracks and his own, um, uh, whatever you call it when you're, when you're locked down underneath. Um, and he, and the movie begins and ends with his last secretary, they made a documentary of his actual secretary saying on camera, I think we pretended not to know what was going on, but we knew what was going on. Now, I, I agree, Valkyrie is more of a war film, but it does sort of reference that Tom Cruise wants to stop him to Hitler because of what he's doing to Jews. Um, the interesting thing is, is that, you know, this is the, why all of a sudden is it so important to explore the Holocaust from the German side? I'm not saying there isn't an artistic value to it. I'm not saying there isn't a validity to it to, from an intellectual perspective. Sure, go right ahead. But it's just an interesting thing to see the, this need to sort of, sort of, oh, we got to explore it from the other side. You know, I, oh, I've never heard anyone on Tishabov say, really, we should go back to the, to, to, to the destruction of the temples and we should explore them from the Babylonians, so from, the, from the Roman side. We should look at it from, you know, from the, you know, why, why don't we go back and, and, and look at the destruction of temples from the Roman side? 
Why don't we go back and look at uh, the Chondiki massacres from the Ukrainian side? Why don't we go back and look at, uh, you know, the Spanish Inquisition from the auto de face, you know, that auto de face, he might not have been such a bad guy, right? So right now they're not actually saying blatantly that Hitler wasn't such a bad guy, but it's kind of becoming this slowly evolving thing that's happening. I'm not, I'm really not trying to give a cautionary tale. So here's what I'd like to, here, I'll stop my share. Here's what I'd like to just say is that, you know, at the core of every anti-Semitism, at the core of every single anti-Semitism that's ever been perpetrated, it's not, it's never about killing Jews. It's always about um, trying to stamp out this darn thing called Judaism. Right. They just want to get rid of those really annoying books that we have, uh, that that scroll that we have. If they could just get rid of that, that would be end of it. So the question is, why, you know, more Jews were killed in the Shoah far and away than any other single persecution that we've had in history. OK, I, I, again, I'm, now there are sources, people out there who can tell me I'm wrong because, you know, I, I'm not as much of a historian. But my understanding is that based on even on the Midrashim, that between both Bias Rishon and Bias Shani, the total number of Jews that were murdered does not equal the total, so, uh, the total number of Jews that were killed in the Holocaust. So why are we sitting here saying, well, let's just throw out, throw out the, you know, throw out the, the, the destruction of the temples and let's talk about the, talk about the Holocaust. Because every single anti-Semitism is about trying to eliminate Jewry. It's about trying to uh, eliminate Judaism itself. When we had the temples, we could practice Judaism unfiltered. It was the freest we've ever been as a people to being able to, we had sacred, we had the temple was there, we had sacrifices, we had every matter of miraculousness in every corner for this for the eyes, for the ears. And that is what we're constantly missing in our lives. I mean, can, the question I'm posing is, can anyone actually imagine waking up tomorrow and thinking that that you know that the Al-Aqsa Mosque won't be there anymore, and the temple will be actually erected, and you could go down there and 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 see everything happening in in in, in the temple the way it should be happening. It's a tough concept for us to get ahead around. It's and that's that's why we cry for 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 for, 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 for the Bati Midrashim. That's why we cry for the loss of our of of our home um i believe that the the, the films the, the stories of, of the shoah is, is so recent it's a great entry point it's a great access point to being able to try and absorb or imbue ourselves with the the sense of loss because trying to access the idea of something we've never seen is as, as many people much smarter than i myself have put it is it's it's just a little too far away it's a little too far removed. Holocaust films are a, a good access point. They're a good tool. They allow us potentially to, in, to get in our heads and to get into our hearts the idea of, of, of the awfulness of what a persecution is like. Um, and um, we can use them to try and achieve the, the goal of Tisha B'Av, to feel, to feel the tears, to feel the, the, the sadness. And um, through that, we should, we should, we should have a gula and um, and we should be, and we should be merit to see the, the, the building of the third of the third uh, base of Mignish speedily in our times. That's all I have for you today. Um, if there, I, I noticed now on on the on the uh, on the uh, chat, there's about a million questions that came up. It's not that I didn't think the questions were valuable. It's just that I have a problem with all of you personally. That's no, true. Um, if there if there are any questions, somebody wants to unmute now and ask any, any questions. Feel free to go right ahead. Yeah. It was mainly comments. I would absolutely unmute yourself. Most of them are comments thanking you for the wonderful, you know, presentation. So uh, feel free to unmute yourself. I just want to say it's uh, it's seven sixteen here in right. Toronto, and uh, we've been going for eight and a quarter hours, and the uh, people have been on all day. I think I think it's a uh, you know a wonderful way to spend to spend Tisha B'av, and I really want I want to thank everybody. We started eight hours ago, eight and a quarter hours ago. Shuli Mishkin began on the destruction, the last years of the first temple period. And now we've brought it up to, you know, Hollywood's 
you know, you know, so to speak, and everything in between. It's uh, a lot to discuss, and I hope a lot of food for thought. And I want to thank everybody for coming, and once again, thank the the the, the Zeifen family for their uh, honoring their their parents and um, and dedicating the learning in their memory. And I want to thank you all for coming, and we'll look forward to learning with all of you. More morning, 11 a.m. Eastern. Uh, Rabbi Nishi Ramurvis on the Ben Ishchai, uh, rabbis from the Islamic world, followed at 12.15 by Rabbi Alex Israel on Lord Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, um, um, discovering his philosophy, et cetera, every week. A uh, different book. Tomorrow's book is Future Tense, I believe. Um, so we look forward to learning with you. We have uh, learning every day of the week, except on Shabbat, and that you can learn at home, and uh, everybody will. Invite your friends to come, and... Um, Thank you. And if anybody has any questions, please free. And uh, thank you. Thank you for that uh, that presentation, really putting a spin on the... Uh, I'm not much of a moviegoer. I, I will admit, I think... Oh, I'm, come on, Jay, I'm, you? I'm not, uh, oh, come son, on. You know, it's very interesting. My 16-year-old son before, I just went out, he was watching Schindler's List. That's what he was doing. Um, oh, that's funny. So that's kind of, you know, interesting. So uh, anyways, okay. Um, everybody be well and um, Jay, thank you Jay thank you to you for setting this whole day up it was incredible yeah thank incredible. you very much thank you. Uh, listen I that's like I mentioned in the beginning you know Torn Motion's history begins in 1989 really when I did the first Torn Motion program back in Clanton Park Synagogue for those in, in, in Toronto and uh, we you know doing that was when I was working as an accountant I was not the uh, practicing in the in the Jewish education field at that point and uh, really and uh, it's made made Tishma very very meaningful like I say I think uh, it's it's not a happy day but it's uh, it's a wonderful inspiring day and um, you know we should use it wisely and take advantage and then uh, grow like you say uh, so we can become come better they were so you go we said all fast we all know fasting to do chuba so so thank you very much thank you for everything okay and uh fast is almost over <laughs> i have to go go down in mincha soon and uh you know haven't oh, put yes. on filling yet you know and, uh, and uh, whatever we'll go and jeff jeff yeah. i have a question for you yes um is the lack of representation of from jewish life in the holocaust due to anti-religion or is it due to the lack of the audience that would be there to to be willing to want to watch it. Yes. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it, I, I, I don't. I don't think that um, there's. there's a, it's, it's. It's actually. I mean, there's. There's another level to it, which is that um, from the mind of the writer, um, it can be tough to make uh, the representation of religion uh, as palpable. Or as 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 sympathetic, believe it or not, as sympathetic, because the minute you you represent a devout individual on screen, all of a sudden the audience kind of like washes over. They're they're like obsessed. They're fundamentalist. So fun, they're kind of a fundamentalist in, in in some way or another. So unless you delve right into that, right into that specifically with that character, with that topic, and the the whole film is about that. An example would be like the two popes which is a recent film that was re released about the Pope Benedict and the, the, the other one that, that switched hands. Um, it's, it's tough to have those elements in the movie without making it feel kind of like a sideline, ignorable thing. It's less primal than what do I got to do to survive? You know, so I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um... Any other questions, Jesse? I see there. Yes, please go out. The recordings will all be available. I will not be available immediately, but it will be available hopefully. Normally, we, we always get things about 24 hours. I'm not so sure. This is a lot of work for our, our tech, uh, um, David, who's our, our, our tech support person, to put all this up. Uh, takes will take a little bit of time, but hopefully within a day or two, it'll all be up on the website. Like all of our, our programs, just go to the program page, you go to the page, you can get many ways to search for it, but then it's, uh, you have everything there on in one place. On the program page, you have the audios, et cetera. Okay. Question. Jeff, you can go. Oh, yes, another question. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, so the Jerry Lewis film seem to have um, a characterization like in the story of Yanis Korchak accompanying his orf orphans into, um, you know, into death. So was that known? Is there any idea about 
what uh, characterizations were known at the time? So that's a great question. I don't know. I don't, I don't know if the script that he was presented with by Washburger, by, um, no, what, yeah, by Washburger was influenced by that, the, the specific uh, story you're mentioning, or whether or not there was, a, there was a cataloging of it. I just know that we, we don't have a copy of the film to watch yet. Some people have seen it um, and that he slaved over it. He, he, Jerry Lewis slaved over it. He was very passionate. I believe, this is my own opinion now, that his failure to release it was more about a an actual like deep seated love of 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 of, of um, Yiddish I don't say Yiddish kite but like just it was just so sensitive it was the first time where he really put himself out there in this way and I think it was just terrifying to him I think he couldn't face it I think he couldn't I, th I think th it's it's like the 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 thing he never finished doing because he can't. You can't anyway, you know, I about the 10, um, uh, anyway, somebody, somebody's unmuted. But I hope that answers your question. I don't yeah, know. Thank you. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Is it? What, what do you mean? That was the Gamora time. Right, they said it. Well, they talked about it. Okay. Is it the Grays? Is it the what? Um, if I could just ask one question. Is yep. the clown, who, uh, the day the clown cried, likely to go into general distribution? Or at least into art art film houses. So so um, Orson Welles made a picture that never got released called um, I think up, up against the wind or some so, so some some title like that so the, the, the blowing in the wind or something like that. They never cut it. A bunch of guys got together in Hollywood about five years ago, finally cut the movie, put it onto Netflix, um, and it got released. So it was, it's readily available. The same thing's going to happen with the day the crown Clyde, the, the, the day the clown cried, it will get released. You won't hear much about it. I mean, you'll, you'll hear something about it. You'll, it'll be articles in, in New York times talking about Israel and how bad they are or something like that. And sorry for all you who, whatever. Um, um, you'll see, um, you'll, you'll, there, there will be, there will be some release of the day the clown cried and you'll be, it'll be readily available, but there will be a, like a premiere screening of it, probably in New York, and and that's where I'd personally like to see it. Yeah. I, so. I was wondering, uh, you're recording everything. Is If I just logged in recently, is there a possible of like spending the rest of the day listening to your recordings or they're not available yet? They're not available yet, no. That's what I said. They will, uh, they have to be uh, edited a little bit, put on the website. Uh, I don't know how to do that stuff myself. So uh, we have somebody who does that for us and um, it should, to by tomorrow or Tuesday at the latest, it should be all up. But there, we do have over 2000 talks to listen to. You can listen to, including many from our, our past issue uh, programs, if that's uh, interesting. But we have a lot of interesting stuff. So we do have, but no, this program, it'll take, uh, it'll take a day or so to get up. Thank you. I hope, uh, I'm sorry we can't do it any quicker. Okay, any other questions? Otherwise, we'll call everybody wish well. It's the last. Uh, yes, is, um, is it the day this, is it the Sun Zone? Is that the name of the film? Son of Saul. Son of Saul is a, Son of, just called Son of Saul. Kind of like right, Son, Son of, of Saul without the serial killer. What, what, what's the other one? The one, sorry, what do you mean the other one? The one the Son of Saul is based on. The gray zone. The gray, it's not the based gray on zone. it. It's not based on it. It just it just owes a lot to the gray zone. I, I, I of the two, I yeah. think there's no comparison. I think the gray zone is a far better film. Um, but um, uh, I mean, but that, but that's 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 a personal taste thing. Certainly, in terms of a contribution to the visual live lexicon of what the Holocaust was. I think that the gray zone has it beat hands down um, from a hi film history perspective, from a film theory perspective, um, and just personal enjoyment. I, I, because the gray zone ultimately is about a group of people and, and it's like sort of, tra it, it's about the institution um, and, and how far, how, who's crazier, them or the other ones. Um, and Son of Saul ultimately is just one man's story on this journey. <coughs> but, some, but Son of Saul is a great film. There's, there's nothing, nothing wrong with it. Anyway, any other questions? Anybody? Any, I, I noticed. I, I, have, like a that. Question. I have a question. Okay, last question. We, oh, I, I, I don't want to burn yeah. this. You know, you know, Jeff, too much. Yeah, okay, go no, ahead. I'm fine. I'm fine. 
Hi, Jeff. As yep. a parent, I know you're a parent of young kids, as, are, yep. as am I. What would you recommend as a good introductory Holocaust film for kids, preteens, or, or really any age when you want to start educating your children about the Holocaust, but not uh, be up, you know, for, for a month with nightmares, um, you know? that kind of thing sort of I would I would tend to go I you know I, I'm glad you asked because I didn't think about it my immediate answer was like uh, nothing uh, but as I thought about it no the, the, the ones that I kind of um, not demeaned or reduced but the ones that I, I don't really hold in as higher regard like Diary of Anne Frank or Julia um, I think are, are are very good because they're they're lavish um, they're, they're lavish uh, period pieces, but the actual threat of on-screen violence or the threat that the film poses to you watching it, the mortality that you may feel is very minimal. It's very much a feel free to indulge in the movie experience in the same way, you know, watching whatever it is, uh, you know, you know it, it, whatever. Um, so I would, I, would tend to, I would tend to say that. I would say either the Diary of Anne Frank 1959 version or, or Julia. For kids, I recommend the book Brenda Bar. Um, there's a Marie Sendak version, and then there's some, they're not films really, but they're plays that are available on YouTube that sort of talk about the children's experience um, in those plays in a way that's not threatening. I watched it with my own 10 year olds and it was um, appropriate. Actually, my, my kids just read Mouse this weekend and uh, you know I didn't get it to them. They, they found it on the shelf and they read it and I was sort of thinking, is this the right thing? But they, they seem to be okay with it and nobody was up crying last night, so. Okay. Okay, everybody well. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, Lila Tov, everybody, enjoy and uh, okay, we look forward to seeing you soon. Okay.